All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, a lot of people are now coming into the webcast uh, as we're getting kicked off. Um, really happy uh, to do a follow on webcast. Uh, about uh, two and a half weeks ago, we ended up uh, doing a ransomware debate uh, on whether or not uh, organizations should pay the ransom uh, when they're infected with it. But one of the things that came out of that ransomware debate where there are a lot of groups out there that are asking specifically for you know, in, in some sort of guidance on what works, what doesn't work, what are some really good recommendations uh, that organizations should really consider in trying to handle ransomware. Um, you know, a lot of folks out there are passing around, you know, oh, you need to do all the basics, you have to, you know, have a proper backup. But beyond a lot of those, you know, critical concepts, uh, what I found is that there's a lot of uh, misinformation and a lot of misunderstanding or, uh, regarding uh, how to handle and how to actually prepare yourself for a ransomware attack. Uh, so I've asked back uh, Ryan Chapman, uh, who is authoring uh, a lot of these thoughts uh, in how to respond to ransomware attacks. Uh, and he's also considering uh, writing uh, a, another class which is more based on the defense and uh, strategies, tactics, also leading into a ransomware defense. There's kind of, kind of potentially two classes that he's uh, kind of ruminating about. Um, and uh, Ryan has uh, been teaching with us in one of our uh, amazing uh, Forensic 610 uh, reverse engineering malware uh, instructors, uh, in addition to being, to being a, a huge lead in the community overall. Um, highly entertaining. I, I truly enjoy uh, just sitting back and, and watching Ryan uh, ruminate on these webcasts. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it as well. Also joining him, uh, James Shank uh, from Team Cymru. Uh, Ryan dragged James into this. I don't know if that was, you know, uh, you know, kicking and screaming uh, because uh, I had not met James in person before. But you know, between James and uh, Ryan on the debate, um, what was interesting is most people actually sided with them. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if it's because they made the most compelling argument or it just, you know, people really leaning toward that. Hey, we do not want to pay the ransom, and we're looking for ways to not have to do that. Uh, you know, but the, the way that debate kind of landed was that, you know, there are some reasons why you want to do it, some reason why you might not to, but a lot of the feedback we got afterwards and questions that came in is like, all right, so we don't have to worry about paying for the ransom. We want to know how to defend it and we want to know how we can best prepare for it. Uh, so without taking up any additional time, I'm going to hand it over to these guys. Now, just a couple notes on these webcasts. Number one, there's a Q&A feature. Um, we're going to be uh, obviously running questions and answers all the way through the webcast. Um, you know, for some of the stuff that's easy to answer, I'll potentially type in uh, answers to the questions as they come in. So will James and Ryan, depending if they're talking, but there will be a formal Q&A at the end of this. This webcast is also being recorded and archived and we put on the SANS YouTube channel uh, at the end of it. And also there's a chat feature if you just want to comment on anything that the uh, you know, presenters are saying. Also, uh, if anyone is on Twitter and wants to, you know, tweet about this, uh, you know, simply just putting a hashtag ransomware, um, you know, and tag at the SANS Institute is always welcome. All right, uh, without further ado, Ryan and James, thank you for coming back and doing this webcast with us. Awesome. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, James, thanks for jumping on again, man. We, uh, we, we Happy met, to. what, a couple of years back, started sharing some intel. And then more recently, I've just been like, Hey, <laughs> James, hey, come hang out with me. <laughs> so thank you for hanging out, man. And welcome everyone to Definitely. Executives and Ransomware. Stop, collaborate, and listen. I got to I got to say it and make it sound cool, but honestly, this was James' this, this, this title. And uh, I got so many emails going, oh, the title alone is awesome. I was like, ah, I didn't even make it up. <laughs> that wasn't even mine. So, all right, we'll get right into it here for you today. Myself, I am Ryan Chapman. Hello, hello. You can hit me on Twitter at RJ underscore Chap. I am a principal IR consultant with BlackBerry Strategic Service, Strategic Services, Security Services. I wrote my own department name wrong. That is absolutely fantastic. I can't wait to get broiled over that. So our security services and strategic services team work together to help folks with ransomware. And so most of the cases I work as an IR consultant these days are the the ransomware right so that's why i kind of live and breathe this environment i'm currently an instructor for forensics 610 reverse engineering malware with sans and i'm currently authoring forensics 528 ransomware for incident responders and that is through the incident responder lens mostly 
technical hands-on analysis type of stuff. More on that as we get closer to a release date. I'm also the lead organizer for CactusCon, which is Arizona's hacker slash security conference. Come check us out this coming up February. And I have a self-promoting silly website to catalog all the fun stuff that I do. Enough about me, James. Hi. Thank you, Ryan. Hi, I'm James. I'm a, a team company veteran. I've been here for uh, over 11 years now, served in a variety of capacities. And uh, right now I'm serving as a chief architect of our community services. For us, the community services are about global outreach and getting information in the hands of network operators and defenders that might not have other means to get access to the information. I'm also a senior security evangelist for Team Cymru, which is why I'm, I'm here talking to you today. I recently served as a ransomware task force participant. Uh, the ransomware task force was a, a quick sprint that was run by the Institute for Security and Technology to put together a set of recommendations for the incoming Biden administration in the US, as well as advise on some uh, international uh, policy for ransomware and the, the governance response to it. Uh, as part of that, I chaired the worst case scenario subgroup. So talking about the, the worst possible incidents that could, could happen. And one, one thing to just highlight about Team Cymru, we host conferences around the world, four per year, and we've got one coming up in Las Vegas, September 29th and 30th. So if you're interested in uh, registering for that or finding out more about that, the link's on your screen now. And if you'll notice in the footer, the link's there as well. So hopefully if you, if you like seeing me virtually, then come along and you'll have an opportunity to see me live and shake my hand. Look forward to seeing you. Awesome. Thank you, James. So uh, housekeeping first up. What we'd like for everyone is to engage. So please is engage as much as possible. In our previous go around, right, in part one, if you will, we had tons of questions, far too many to actually be able to answer live during the session. And that's what we're looking for this time, really. We want any and all questions you could possibly throw our way. Uh, we do have time reserved toward the end of our talk to do a live Q&A session and also uh, as Rob noted, we'll hopefully try to get some stuff answered while we're doing our little discussion today. So uh, the Q&A function in Zoom should be live. If it's not, then just you know get your messages to us via the panelist option, but try to use the Q&A, should be there for you. All right, so when we set out to do this, we talked about breaking it up into themes and we came up with five general themes that we wanted to discuss today. I know in some of the advertisements, it said that we were going to provide a checklist. Well, we, we kind of uh, faked you out there a little bit. The intention here is to engage, to bring up ideas and to get you thinking. The hope is, is that you'll be taking notes as we're uh, moving through this. And we want you to adapt what we're saying to the needs of your organization, to fit your risk profile and to think about the broader picture. As a just a general con, uh, uh, note about canned checklists, while canned checklists might be what you're looking for, uh, if that's the case and you really need it, that starting place, uh, NIST is developing, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US is developing a checklist. Uh, FBI has published their own checklist and CISA under DHS has published a checklist as well. So those might be some resources that you can look for, but be thinking as we're talking through this about the impact to your business and then take notes on that and that'll lead you well to writing your own checklist. Awesome. We're really focusing on the things that we're seeing that are not being done or not being done well, but a lot of times just not being done within organizations. Myself with BlackBerry Consulting, when we have our clients come in, a lot of times they mean extremely well, but they just didn't realize that A, B, C, and all the other, uh, apparently there's 50 letters now in the alphabet, they all occur right, when, when ransomware strikes. And the thing that we're really seeing is that folks just caught off guard. It's everyone has, has read about ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. And they think, well, we're securing these things technically, we're working on phishing kind of thing. But when it does hit, they're just not prepared. And so we've tried to synthesize all those different things that, that we see them not being prepared for and go like, hey, look, <laughs> look at it, look at it, look at it. And that's what this presentation is all about. So please take notes and please engage internally with your teams. Just like James said, James said, better yet, if we gave you a general checklist, you know, I work with gr groups all the time who sometimes they'll engage with us just because they want to, you know, check off a checklist. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> take it seriously, focus it and adapt it to you and yours. And that's what we're here to do today.
So what are those five themes that we came up with? We're starting out with understanding the impact to your business. This is where ransomware starts to take hold and starts to make things stressful. How to establish and maintain business plans. The key here is review and practice. Making security helpful and not a blocker. Security should be a driver of business, not a, a gatekeeper. And due diligence and preparation for response flexibility. That's a really cute way mouthful. of saying. <laughs> that's a mouthful, and it's a cute way of saying, "Hey, uh, if you're going to end up paying, you really need to understand what that truly entails." More on that when we get to the slide. And then, of course, your favorite, your boy, technical defenses. I find that most ransomware talks focus on this guy. And I also find that most organizations focus on that guy. And that's why we have specifically put it down toward the bottom. Now, is it the least important? Well, no, duh. But uh, you'll see our whole design is like, these are things people aren't paying attention to. And then also, yeah, technical is very important. All right, so when it comes to ransomware, you know, what is the whole threat? What is the whole point of all of this? Well, a group comes in and they either exfil data and then pressure you about the exfil data, which we're seeing sometimes today, or they come in, exfil the data and encrypt X number of devices within your environment. You know, what are they really trying to do? Well, do they really even care about your data? Well, some of them, some of them do, but for the most part, there's, there's actually some of them really do, but for the most part, the whole idea is they're trying to put the squeeze on, on you and your organization. They want your money. It's a financially incentivized attack. That's the whole point of this, right? If you looked back even five years ago and you'd be like, oh, financial crime, that's boring. I want to work the APT stuff. I want to work the advanced persistent threats, you know, where they really, really the what's the real, real problem we're dealing with today? It's this, it's financially driven. And what is actually driving organizations such as yourself to pay up, to pay that ransom? It is the pressure that mounts when you no longer have a business. Whatever functions or services you provide, those are unavailable. So if you can't do what makes you, you, sometimes it comes down to you either pay the ransom or you no longer exist, right? So that is the pressure, the impact to your business. That is the pressure. Now, the impact of functions and services, a lot of folks sometimes don't realize that IT is an enabler and IT allows that and that and that and that and all these other things to function. When I say IT, I mean just a general computing device that you can log into, you know, even you're like, oh, HR, they're not heavily reliant on IT. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know about all that. So um, HR has to log into a computer and well, do they use what, Excel, right? What are they using? Are they using a cloud-based service? Like how do they get to that service? A lot of folks, what they do is they just think about their crown jewels. And when we start a consultant, uh, a scoping call with our clients, right, let alone a kickoff call, for incident response, the things I need to know right away, what are your crown jewels? I need to know what those are. And many times organizations will have an idea. Sometimes they won't know exactly where they are, but they'll have an idea at least of what those are, right? Because duh, that's what enables their business. However, we don't just want to focus on the crown jewels. If you only focus on the crown jewels, you're not realizing that IT is an enabler that allows those crown jewels to exist or to function in some way, shape or form. So you have to take everything into an account. Right, and one of the things that, that this brought up when Ryan and I were chatting about this and preparing this is the idea of hidden dependencies. Now, recently we all went through a pretty unique experience that we probably have never gone through before, the pandemic, lockdowns. Suddenly your workforce shifted from being in the office behind your perimeter defenses to remote. What did you learn from that experience? What did that highlight? And how can you apply those lessons to mapping out hidden dependencies that exist and are embedded within the rest of your systems and, and response plans? One of the stories that I heard was about the pandemic specifically was that in, in one European country, they didn't have any problems creating hand sanitizer during the hand sanitizer shortage. They had vats and vats of it. What they ran out of was the bottles to put it in. Those sorts of hidden dependencies, they exist in any complex systems and any interconnected systems. Think through those. Now that might seem like a, a hard problem to solve, but one possible solution here is consider surveying your staff. 
launch a survey, ask it, may, maybe even have it be uh, anonymous if, if there's reasons that some things might not be, uh, if people might not be uh, comfortable expressing things. But every organization has skeletons in the closets. And when you transition jobs, you'll oftentimes be surprised at the skeletons in the closets that you might find there. Somebody knows they're there. You just need to get that signal up to the people that need to plan around it. Consider as well the financial impacts. Think through the worst case scenarios. What happens the day that you come in and you can't pay your, your uh, vendors? What happens when you can't accept payments from your clients? What about payroll and payroll processing? Some of, some of you are bound by SLAs or contractual and regulatory requirements. What happens when you go over on the timelines that are granted for those? What are the critical servers that you rely on for your business to process payments and run any of your, any substantial part of your business? Uh, think more long-term as well, because there are some more long-term financial impacts. When you highlight skeletons in the closet, you now want to resolve those skeletons so it doesn't happen again. So you're going to see some of those. You're going to have some, some costs to shore up your defenses, to shore up your, your security posture, but you also have business losses and you're going to have to do some work to regain some of your uh, customer confidence, depending on the, the PR handling and the response of your clients. That takes us to the first, the first, the first of uh, potentially many bullet points where we talk about cyber insurance. Many organizations are under the impression these days because they see the news articles say, oh, oh, okay, well, they had cyber insurance. Cyber insurance actually paid the ransom. They got back up and running in X number of uh, days or weeks or whatever it was. When it comes down to it, whether you have cyber insurance or not, it doesn't necessarily, it's not a magic bullet to immediately allow your organization to return back to, to normal, to working order. There's also the financial impact of having to have this cyber insurance. And as we have more and more and more, I mean, we're, we're seeing a hockey stick as they call it, right? Just exponential growth almost with ransomware. Now, technically, technically, that's actually a lie because in Q1 of this year, we're actually seeing the number of organizations go down just a bit as ransomware groups look to be targeting larger organizations with more money, but we're still seeing a ton of just, you know, people who are like, why would they ever hit me? You know, I'm, I'm a bug extermination company. Like who, who cares about me? Like well, you have money, right? <laughs> like you make money, right? We're still seeing a ton of that. So you have to think about is, you, if you don't have cyber insurance now and you're thinking about, well, I need to look into that, look into it uh, yesterday, like now, now, because the financial impact of just maintaining that is going to be going up and up and up and up and up. And on top of that, the financial burden of even being able to get Cyber insurance is, and I guarantee you, it's going to be going up and up and up and up and up. It already is. We're already seeing that. There's multiple reports out there. I can link to some after the fact. And what we're seeing also in this regard is that insurance companies are now requiring kind of like hygiene checks, essentially. And m many of these hygiene checks are not covered by the insurance company. So it's kind of like if I want to get uh, medical insurance, I have to go in for a doctor's visit. I get a little physical, a little checkup, right? See, seeing how my stuff's all ticking inside. Now, they're not going to cover that. They're like, go get the checkup. Let us know how it went, right? That cybersecurity checkup, whether it's done with a group like our strategic services, and they look in and they're like, oh, here's what you have on policy on paper, or whether it's an actual review of your technical environment, right? They're running scripts and pulling stuff, and they're going, this is your environment sucks. <laughs> like, right, just paying for that. That's going to cost you. So um, don't just think that insurance is a, a safeguard, and it's just you're just going to pay a certain amount, and then you're going to be good. The costs are going up, the, the requirements to even getting the insurance is going up. And if you have not already played that game, you need to jump in and, uh, and roll the dice, basically. That gives us a segue right into business planning because insurance is a part of that planning. And a question that just came in about the, whether insur cyber insurance pay, uh, insurers pay or not, this is going to depend on your contract. But build that into your continuity, uh, business continuity plan and your disaster response plan. That should involve a review, both of the plan, but of your insurance policies, as well as any other contingencies that you have. When you're doing your business continuity planning and your disaster re uh, re uh, response planning, think about the impact of the business overall. Perform gap analysis so that you can understand what does it cover and what does it not cover. Consider running through practice scenarios like tabletop exercise where you, exercises where you set up 
uh, 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 set up a mock scenario, and then you ask your your staff to run through what are the implications of that. Take notes diligently during that because you're going to hear some comments, you're going to hear some responses from your staff that don't really surface via any proactive form of communication in a in a full way. You're going to hear the sentiments, you're going to see the facial reactions, you're going to get a different sort of input, and that's those are the things that you'll want to probe a little bit more on to understand. What are those dependencies that are on uh, that are as yet unsurfaced? Also, consider the form of events that your, your disaster continuity plan or, or business continuity plan and disaster response plan is written around. Does it cover major events or only minor events? Now, part of that has to do with understanding risk and looking at the likelihood of of the impact in certain uh, certain responses or certain events happening to your entity, but. With ransomware, the, the as Ryan uh, astutely pointed out, there is a perhaps a reduction in the overall incidence of ransomware because they're going after bigger targets. They're they're trying to they're, they're doing big game, game hunting, in other words, trying to get those massive payments rather than the smaller payments. However, the the rate of incident is still increasing. Uh, well, in general, the impact of it is increasing. So consider that in your risk planning and make sure that you're you're addressing that properly. I remember a uh, conference so I was at, there were panelists that represented three different companies uh, that had data centers in uh, the New York region during uh, Hurricane Sandy, and they all had disaster response plans, but they fared entirely differently. And their stories uh, mirror, in some ways, some of the, the completeness of those plans, as well as what they had set up and how much they had dedicated towards practicing and considering different contingencies. So consider them. Think about them now because something will happen or is very likely to happen. And now is the time that you have to position yourself so that you have more flexibility and you fare better later. Absolutely, and here's a big one. We find, and I say it all the time, that DRPs are not taking into consideration the system availability. So ask yourself this, if you have this methodology of, oh, we're going to be able to recover sites X, Y, and Z. We've got everything taken care of. We're going to do all these things. It's going to be great. What systems are you actually depending on in order to do that? So the best example I could possibly think of is Active Directory. What if Active Directory is down? AD is down. You don't have Active Directory. Oh, well, we're, we're well, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> that's usually the response that, that we get. Many times we'll go into an environment and say, okay, we need to deploy this particular script, this tool, this whatever throughout, you know, everything, or at least to these various network segments or whatever. And the response is, oh, uh, well, we were gonna do that via GPO. That's what we normally do. And that's not, that's not available. Or, oh, we use SCCM. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Didn't you just tell me SCCM is encrypted? And they're like, yeah, <laughs> okay. Now what, what's your backup? And they're like, I don't know, you tell me. I'm like, oh. <laughs> You really need to take into account the systems that are going to enable the plant, the pieces of your DRP. Like, what's what does that rely on? You know, oh well, if uh, if we have an Azure outage, uh, we use the Azure redundancy. So we'll just go. This site's down. We use that site. Uh, you know, over there. Okay. Well, how often is that site mirror the initial site? Like, you know, is it a hot site? How's that all work? It all needs to be taken into account within that BCP slash DRP. And if you don't have that, you are definitely going to run into a situation with ransomware where when you have systems that you rely upon heavily, such as Active Directory, I cannot stress that enough. When it's unavailable, you're gonna feel like a fish out of water. And that's more impact to you to be to open the wallet and be like, okay, well, sucks for us, we gotta pay. From there, the next most important element is your communication plan. This is about keeping everybody updated with a current status that they need. Think through here, though. There's some hidden gotchas here. If your communication plan is stored on your documentation system or your internal wiki, what if that's not available? What are you doing now? Who's calling who and who's informing everybody of what the business needs from them at that time? Think through the PR implications because Ransomware right now is a hot media item. The media is reaching out to companies, looking for interviews, looking for statements. Who picks up that phone call and what is your response? Your HR department also 
needs to be part of your communication plan. Your employees might wonder, what is expected of me? Do I have to report to work? Hey, my, I'm not able to log in. What is what does, burden do I have or, or what uh, obligations do I have to the business at that time? And your legal team needs to be plugged into this. This there's two components here to the legal team side, by the way, because you have you have legal review of what's going on, but you're also going to have to have engagement with law enforcement, or you or you should. The earlier you involve law enforcement, the better. And that and when you start to involve law enforcement, it's best if you know their names before you pick up the phone and call them. So think of through that, think through that communication plan and figure out what that looks like. I had to unmute myself. Oh my goodness. So far into the uh, <laughs> remote work pandemic. And I was like, don't talk on mute. Don't do it. But I'll talk about how I almost did it. Incident response planning. And by the way, there are a bunch of questions coming in now. Fantastic. We love that. I'm trying to see how we can best fit it in live or if we should do it in the Q&A session. Keep, keep those coming. Obviously, you have to have an incident response plan. One of the things that we see that is not being done very well in these plans is identifying and pre-establishing your incident command. And when I say incident command, I mean all the different pieces of your incident command. So as an IR analyst, right, in my former life uh, working for a large company at the uh, quote unquote last job, and uh, I, I functioned as an incident commander. And that was great, but it wasn't just an incident commander. You can't just have one. What if that person's out sick or what if that person no longer works there and they're still assigned to incident commander. You have to have a pool of incident commanders who are trained and maintained. That training is maintained to be able to take over an incident. On top of that, they need an incident command team. If you have all these different pieces of your IT infrastructure, and of course you do, right? And they're probably all siloed. You have your general, uh, you have your help desk, which you're going to need. You're going to have your, uh, your on-site IT team, the people who go in and mess with computers for people who are on-site. You're going to have your networking team. You're going to have your authentication team, all, all these different pieces, right? They all have to be able to communicate and collaborate with your hands-on security team, whether that is a SOC, a CERT, a consultant agency, whatever it is. You have to have a team, and that team has to have established contacts, subject matter experts, and oftentimes it needs to have a pool of them when folks are not, at least backups for when they're not available. And James brought this up and it hit home with me because of a, a recent uh, thing I ran into with, uh, with some of my CactusCon endeavors. And I'll give you a great example. This is the idea is uh, not just yelling into a crowd when there's an emergency, someone call 911. Is that actually gonna happen? Everyone just thinks, oh, well, duh, this is critical. Someone's gonna do it, right? You're supposed to assign someone, you, hey, you, in the red shirt, I'm colorblind, so I wouldn't use colors, but I'd be like, hey, you, with the dragon on your shirt, whatever. Go call 911. So if you don't do that, you just make an assumption that someone's going to do that. And I did. I made that mistake with my own conference, the Cactus Con. I was like, oh, hey, I, can someone please do this? And then I went on vacation and I got back and I was all pissy, like, well, no one did that. And they're like, I thought someone would do it. <laughs> I'm like, duh, dude, you didn't tell anyone to do it. You just threw it out there and went on your little vacation. So it's very important that you have a group of incident commanders that you trust and that they have people under them that they can trust. And they need to have relationships with all your different IT departments. And not just, by the way, your IT departments. But take a look at all your different executive branches and see how they may be involved with a ransomware situation. Just like we talked about above, right? PR, HR, and legal. Do you have incident commanders? Do they have a relationship with those departments already? If they don't, they really should. They absolutely should. So, you know, I last job when I was working for a, a larger company versus dealing with multiple clients, I knew all those departments. I knew people in every single one of them. And I would randomly send them messages like, hi, <laughs> remember me in security? Because I always wanted them to know that they, when it hits the fan, like, I'm going to come knocking. <laughs> I'm going to be your boy. So it's important. Another thing is differentiating recovery and remediation. So SANS as a, an organizational unit is making a move or has made a move. Um, the past, I think, 18 months now, um, even in 504, we've kind of picked apart the pickerel methodology. We've picked apart the pickerel. That's a fun sentence to say. And we've gone with more of an OODA loop type of fashion, a dynamic IR response. And what it does is instead of just, you know, preparing, identifying, containing, okay, so far, eradicating, and then we have recovery. 
And then there's this lesson learned thing, which no one does. Don't lie. No one does it. So you have this, but you have this recovery. And what most groups do is they focus on recovery. I can guarantee you, if you're calling our group, right? You're like, uh, hey, you know, we have a retainer with you. We just got hit. Here's what we need. What's going to come out of your mouth next is we need our freaking services up and running. You're not going to be like, oh, we need to you know, find out what's going on, where the malware is. You don't care about all that as the business, as the organization, as our client. You care about getting things up. You're like, Ryan, come on, let's go. <laughs> I need my services functioning. So what happens is we end up with recovery, not necessarily also meaning remediation overall, but rather just recovery. I want these services going and functioning. So SANS as a group, and I fully stand behind this, we are now splitting out very specifically recovery and, and remediation. I personally believe, this, this is me personally, I believe that you should never close out an incident without fully addressing or at the very least having very, very specific milestones and having those sent way up the chain for oversight, for remediating the issues that caused that incident in the first place. And what we're normally seeing, that word was normally is what I was going for. What we're normally seeing is we're seeing this. We're seeing people recover and there's no actual remediation. Oftentimes we'll say, oh, they got into the RDP. That sucks. You know, they, they hit one of our terminal services servers. It was that they had some weak passwords. We, we rotated those and we made a ticket, right? We made a ticket to address the other stuff that may be part of RDP disasters down the line. And then we make it that client six months down the line. And they're like, oh, hey, remember, remember how that one group got in via RDP? Yeah, well, yeah, well another group got in via RDP. And we're like, cool story. <laughs> so very, very important that you take those both into consideration. That's that's an essential point, uh, Ryan. I was when you were saying that, one of the things that came to mind is that your after action reviews and after action reports on these incidents use those as a way to inform the policies and changing your procedures next time right because with these key points of recovery and remediation get those those after action thoughts right away to get get your employees to think through what went well what didn't go well what did we miss because that's there there isn't any better teacher than than the teacher of experience right so that's where you're going to get the most raw most poignant points for what you need to do next time and unfortunately, with ransomware, a lot of recent reports say that next time might happen. So uh, don't think that, oh, we got hit once. Now it's now we're done. Uh, uh, we, we were, you know, we're, we're in the clear now. But also, I mentioned as well before, like knowing who knowing your law enforcement agents by name is going to help during these incidents. Relationships with vendors is going to help a lot, too. If the person that picks up the phone knows you, that's going to put you, it, it, it just makes the whole scenario go better. I mean, I, I don't know how to, how to actually put that into better context than having a chat with somebody you know goes a lot smoother than having a chat with somebody that you don't. And one of the things that I, I would encourage you to think about from your vendors, uh, your vendor's perspective is you're here to hear about tips and tricks. Hey, call them up and ask them, what are they seeing? What trends do they, they notice today? And what if they had one or two suggestions for you right now to consider, what would they be? All of these perspectives, they're going to lead you to a better, better position. And you might as well use those, those gathering methods for shoring up relationships with real people. Another point about vendors, ransomware is a hot topic right now. And there are shortages of response staff for, for these events. Having those relationships may get you priority handling and might help your entire response go more smoothly. Okay, security should be integrated within the organization, but it should not be a hindrance. And what we see is something on either side of that spectrum. We see that security is not integrated. We see that changes are implemented, projects are pushed, new systems are launched, all these things. And security is never like, hey, security, by the way, they don't even tell them, they're just there. I don't know how many times an organization will give me access 
for example, to a SIM, right, or a log aggregator, be it uh, Elasticsearch, uh, Alien Vault, Splunk, oh, I love Splunk, whatever it is, right? And they're like, hey, look, look in there. And I'm all of a sudden, I'm like, hey, what's this log? What's this index? What's that? What's this, what's this tool? Why There's tons of logs for it. What is that? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> like, what do you mean you don't know? Well, we gave them the UDP address and they just fire logs over, I don't know. Or even better, I'll see like nothing in there. And I'm like, hey, you know, do you have these types of applications? And they'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> so security is left out completely in the cold, right? The opposite of that is we then see, and this is unfortunate, we see the overlord security and it's security. I'm doing a superhero pose. You can't really see it, but <laughs> we have security who is just constantly vigilant and watching. And it's like, you want to do what? Wait a minute. I'm security. <laughs> I can't do it without laughing. I have to look into this. And then we get this project that needs to be implemented in X number of weeks. Like, look, we have two weeks, like boom, 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 boom. And security's like, well, we're going to take three weeks to review it. And then it's like, no, 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 no. Security cannot be a hindrance. Security has to be something, it's a general enabler, but it has to be something that is integrated. So you have to find that sweet spot. And to discuss that more, we have James. <laughs> right. So. It <laughs> yeah, I think you did a great job there. I love, I love your how animated you are, Ryan. Um, in a lot of cases, security is tacked on at the last minute, right? It's not part of the project from start to finish. It's not part of the product from start to finish. It's not part of uh, part of much at all of the process. Security is forced into this gatekeeper sort of role, and that doesn't go well because that delays time the the time that the project uh, takes. And that also positions security in a way of stopping the business from accomplishing what the business ultimately cares about. Because businesses, there are some businesses that do make their money in the practice of security itself. Um, most of them are called MSSPs or, or <laughs> play that sort of role. But most, most of the time, businesses are providing a completely different service. And security always being positioned at the very end, tail end as a review sort of gatekeeper sort of role position security in the worst possible way because it's just making things take longer. And it's also frustrating the developers and the people that were assigned to the product that uh, product development that uh, have spent quite a bit of time on this. The better approach is to not silo security. Yes, you will need your, 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 uh, your security organization, but what is their role in project management and product management and change management processes? there should be security leadership throughout all of those processes as products are are started to be conceived tack security on so that they know ahead of time what might be coming and they in in this way they can help to lay the path to business success instead of being seen as the the uh you know crossing guard with the stop sign at the very end of the uh, of the project think through how does security integrate during your implement implementation phases is security embedded within engineering teams in the architecture phases? What, what is their role and how do you enable security to have a business first mindset, right? This is, this is essential because in the security leadership staff, they should be talking about ways to enable security, or pardon me, uh, to enable business objectives, not just stop business objectives because of a security concern. It can't be stop it has to be this is how we can do it not this is what we cannot do it's it, I, I, once you get down to the the brass tacks and the technical side there might be some things that hey we just simply can't do that uh, that way but that's not really what it's about it's about the bigger picture what is what is security doing they're paving a path a path towards success to accomplishing business objectives in this way you'll have an integrated security staff and you'll start getting ahead of some of the embedded system, uh, systemic problems of security that last for years and years. I jumped ahead of slide, how dare I? There's one more bullet point. So what I've personally seen work well, right? How do you integrate security without it being an impact, right? Or the hindrance is to set up SLAs, right? So you set up and you say, hey, we need security review. And by the way, I recommend you avoid completely the term oversight. The very, very, it has a very negative connotation. And that gets back to that whole, like, I'm security, ah, and no, right? 
you just want to have security review, or, or maybe you can actually have a little checkbox that says security should take a look see. <laughs> I would love to see that in an environment. Security, can you take a look see, please? But you establish a timeline for them, for their security groups. You know, if you have an infosec, it's a policy team, they have X amount of time to review that. So you give them the opportunity, but you don't necessarily give them the reins and let them like, oh, we're going this way now. You know, so we've seen that work well. I've seen it work well specifically. So I recommend taking a look into that. All right. Due diligence and preparation for response flexibility. Okay, this, this slide discusses and concerns ransomware payments. That's what we're talking about. We didn't want to call it ransomware payments, but rather it's flexibility, <laughs> response flexibility. So in our first segment, it was a whole debate over should you pay or should you not pay, right? We had two sides. James and I both took the, oh, you shouldn't pay side. We both, however, recognize that in many situations in the current day climate that you sometimes have to pay. There are groups where it's a utilitarian decision, like, well, we're, we're gonna have to pay. If we don't pay, you know, 2000 people lose their jobs, our company goes under completely. Um, and then what's the opposite side of that? Well, what's the money going to fund? Well, they don't know. Uh, what, what's the negativity of that? Well, we don't, we really don't know. It's probably bad. And it's gonna instigate more ransomware, but we really don't know. You have to have a plan. Within whatever plan you have it fall under, right? Whether you actually have it under your disaster response plan, whether you have it a recovery plan, excuse me, someone called it, called me out on that earlier in the chat, or whether it's part of your IRP, whatever it is, you have to have in writing definitions, terms defined for ransomware that involve potential payment. You need to understand what the financial impacts of those could be. And you have to have those cataloged and written down. I know I just said that twice, but I'm doing it for a reason, write it down. <laughs> it needs to have things like, what bucket of money might that come out of? If you don't already have that set up and you don't already have that pre-approved through your financial office, right? Your CFO, uh, he, she, they has literally signed it off saying, in the case that this does happen, this is the bucket this will come from. This is how it will be funded. If you don't have that, you'd be amazed at the amount of bickering and just everyone losing their freaking mind that you're going to run into when all of a sudden someone says, I need a million bucks. Where's that come from? Well, it comes from security through the incident commander. The incident commander then goes up to whomever that person reports to. Maybe they're talking to the CEO, right? Maybe you're a medium-sized organization and your IC is a, your C-level CISO, right? And they're like, hey, uh, 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 can I have a million bucks? <laughs> like, I really need a million bucks. Where's it going to come from? You have to have that neatly defined. You have to preset that up. If you don't, the amount of bickering is going to be ridiculous. And it's because people are like, I don't want it coming out of my bucket. I can't have that. That's a massive impact. Maybe you take it out of multiple ones, but you have to have that defined and written down. Okay. And legal right now, like right, right now, it is not officially illegal in the general blanket statement to pay a ransomware payment but there are many discussions going on in many different countries. Are we going to make paying ransomware payments illegal? And there are also questions coming in, for example, to SANS. Um, some of them are coming my way, like, hey, do you think we should comment on this? And I'm like, from a SANS perspective? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we should comment on that. Should the United States, for example, make it illegal? Well, we don't have a lot of resources right now to actually provide, here's how you can avoid doing that. So you're kind of hamster, it's, it's this whole weird debate, but it's important that you are fully aware of the potential legal repercussions. So do you know your local state statutes, right? I live in Arizona. So we have the Arizona revised statutes, the ARS. Do I know like what's in there involving payment to foreign entities? Is that, is that a thing at the state level? Or would that even be a thing, right? Right now, you think, well, that's ludicrous. That's your state law. Why would that even be in there? You may want to. You may want to keep your eye on those things, though. Um, I personally believe that some states will start making weird movements on these things, but that's just my thought. It's important that you're aware what's legal and what's not legal, not just based on where you're located, but based on where the threat actors are located. If you even know where they're located, some of them are pretty obvious about we're so and so group. We're based out of here. Sucks for you. Give us money but it's important you take that into consideration. And that leads right into what right now is a potential impact to you, and that's regulatory. 
Thanks, Ryan. Uh, one, one other interesting legal ramification that I ran across the story on uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago that, that is something to consider. With a lot of ransomware actors now, they're also exfiltrating data. After one company was ransomware, they got a follow-up a copyright violation lawsuit. It's possible, it's not confirmed, but it's possible that the data exfiltration and the data being made public resulted in that that copyright lawsuit. Now, of course, we shouldn't be doing copyright violations in the first place, but think through like what happens when the, all the skeletons in your closet that we talked about before are now aired as your dirty laundry and somebody else is looking through them. On the regulatory side, right now, uh, it, whether, whether or not it's illegal to pay ransoms is a kind of separate question from things like OFAC and sanctions. In the US right now, there's several uh, individuals and groups that are currently sanctioned by the Department of State, uh, namely CryptoLocker, SamSam, Evil Corp, and Lazarus in my recent search of, of who, is, who is on that sanction list. You don't know who's receiving this money. And one thing to mention about the sanction list, people don't get put on the sanction list for jaywalking. These are, these are up bubbling up to the top of, of the people that you don't want to put money in their hands in the first place. So think about that when you're considering to pay or not to pay, but keeping abreast of all of those uh, sanctions and where the money is flowing, that might be a little bit difficult. You have to stay on top of it. Interestingly as well, like uh, recent news, uh, I, I saw a story uh, that on Monday, there was a proposal in Australia to make payment of ransomware mandatory reporting. Now this was one of the, the recommendations of the ransomware task force uh, report that right now there's a, a lack of, of complete data on ransomware and the impact of it and who's paying. Australia has a bill introduced right now uh, if you want to look it up, it's called the Ransomware Payments Bill of 2021. And uh, this bill proposes that any business paying ransomware ransoms that has a average income of or, or a annual income of more than 10 million must report those. That might be coming elsewhere too. Stay abreast of the, the legal situation and the regulatory uh, situation that the decision to pay or not to pay puts you in. Also, if you're going to pay via crypto, if it would ever even be a possibility. Now, I'm just talking crypto right now, and I don't want to jump into this because time-wise, we gotta we gotta keep an even flow here. We're getting up toward the end of our, our talk time, uh, and keep the questions coming in. I'm answering as fast as I can. I feel like we're not gonna have much of a Q and A session. We've just got so much to talk about here. But anyway, right now it's crypto, right? If you don't have a pre-established environment or setup where you can go and purchase quickly crypto and then send it out to whomever you may need to do that, you may be amazed at what it takes to actually get that set up. A lot of people think that it's very, very easy and quick to purchase crypto. And some people out there are going, well, it is. I mean, I have a crypto ATM down the street. I actually have one. It's not far from here, but I'm not going to buy millions of dollars from it. I'll tell you that. So the idea is when Dogecoin, everyone's going to laugh at Doge to the moon, right? When Dogecoin hit, I think it was like 20 cents. I, was, I thought to myself, okay, I'll go get some. But I didn't currently have uh, anything set up for purchasing crypto. And it took me about four and a half, almost five days for everything to fully ratify, have my accounts approved. And I tried to go through three different orgs to get it the quickest. By the time I was actually able to purchase it, the price had gone from 20 up to, I think it was, I bought at 26 or something like that. So I wanted to buy at 20. I made the decision. I'm going to pay that. I'm going to buy that. And I wasn't able to, because I wasn't already prepared for the amount of time it actually takes to facilitate that purchase. And when you're thinking about payments and, and procuring Bitcoin to pay, consider the market fluctuations. It, it, Bitcoin is, in, is incredibly unstable and very volatile. And one, one interesting case recently, Colonial Pipeline, we've learned a lot of lessons from Colonial Pipeline. It's been all over the place. But when they paid their ransom, they paid something like $4.4 .4 million in Bitcoin. And that was 75 Bitcoins. The FBI was able to re, uh, reclaim most of that payment. They recovered 63.7 Bitcoins 
out of that payment. But at the time that they recovered that, the price of that Bitcoin dropped to $2.2 million. So even in the case that your, your payment might be able to be reclaimed, which is not common, you still might take a substantial financial hit on, on that money. And it just speaks to the volatility of crypto in general. Then we get into the negotiations. If you've been hit with ransomware, you are most likely going to have to negotiate. Whether that negotiation even includes a, uh, you know, go away, we're not going to pay you. Sometimes you may not negotiate at, at that point. But if you do pay, or even if you're just trying to get more information on should we pay, you're going to have to engage in a conversation with a skilled threat actor who has done the exact thing they're about to do with you with many other people. And oftentimes you, if you're doing this in-house, don't have that level of experience. And sometimes you'll say, oh, we'll throw someone from security on that and we'll just reply. You know, hey, this is the IT director from so-and-so. Um, how's it going? Yeah, we don't have $4 million. Uh, can we give you 50 bucks? <laughs> if you do it in-house versus externally, there are pros and cons of both sides. It's important that you evaluate those. We could sit here for a full hour, if not an entire day or even a week, really, and discuss the general pros and cons. But keep in mind, it's psychological warfare at this point. When you engage in those conversations, that's the way I look at it. And if you don't understand the, the true mindset of these folks, and if you don't understand how to read behind what they're actually telling you, read between the lines, that could be a detriment. Whereas many external negotiators are very adept at, at doing that. That's what they do. Um, I have conversations set up for things I want to talk about in 528 with various negotiators. I want to talk about very specific things. I send my clients over to them, you know, if they're like, we're going to have to pay us. Okay, we don't do the negotiations in-house for many reasons. Uh, here are some trusted resources. And when they go to those resources, you have to remember, they are now representing you officially to that threat actor. So if whatever they say, if they make a mistake, or if they say something where you're like, oh, I would have gone, you know, whatever it is, like you have instilled your trust and it is, you're not taking that back. Then again, some negotiators or external have very solid relationships with these groups because they deal with them all the time. It's actually kind of sad. They could be like, oh, is that Nancy? Oh, hey, Nancy, are you representing this company too? Yeah, we popped them too. <laughs> it's kind of ugly, but you know, you have that as an, op uh, an option also. So research negotiation you have to have a plan in your policy for potential negotiation do not do not randomly tell your incident commander hey please negotiate please don't do that you will regret it so on the topic of checklist when i went to review the checklist for for uh, that are available uh, via nist and everything and the, the other agencies that release them it's the same old, everything's, everything's been addressed before, mostly. So when Ryan and I were talking about this, we kind of said like, look, these kind of map to different decades of, of what the hot topic in security was. Perimeter defenses, this is going back to like the 1990s model of block at your exterior, have firewalls, have uh, update your rules and whatnot. And one of the things that I, I would say that gets added to that now, it, it was important, asset management was important then, but it's it's more important now because now with the pandemic, the shift is now you've got external asset, uh, assets and the guidance in for uh, perimeter defense now, at least at the federal level, there's a, a executive order that mandates a zero trust model. So there is a shift from that that old uh, perimeter defense of your perimeter is your, your first barrier to a more wholesome thinking of of think about the trust relationships between devices and people as your first uh, your your first line of defense. Also, software patching. Zero days are super hot, super interesting stories, but they don't make it into most incident responses. The, the real fact is, zero days, while they are used, they're not the common initial vector on these sorts of attacks. Stay abreast of software patching and Look for those advisories. If the US government and if other federal governments around the world are talking about a threat, it's a big deal. Pay attention to that stuff first and get it, get the patching done. External remote connectivity. 
for years, the older thought was lock everything down. Don't let anything on the inside. Don't let anything on the outside. Now we have flipped that on its head, but unfortunately we've done so a little too broadly. So we are opening up remote connectivity for all of our workers right now because of the whole pandemic thing. But even well before that, it was establish these VPNs, let these folks in, set up uh, these remote connectivity applications, uh, go through the change management board, not nah, just set it up. People need to be able to access systems. Like let's make it happen. Uh, install Citrix, get applications available and ready. Uh, are you going to patch those things? Uh, just make it available, <laughs> right? So we now have to keep in mind how much we're actually opening up. What is one of the top two major vectors for ransomware? RDP, good old standard ingressing port 3389. That is ridiculous. That takes us to email security. Now, given our time, we're going to have to, you know, go a little bit quicker through these items. And that was kind of the, the purpose, by the way, it's, we wanted to keep technical as the last bit because everything else is so important and not done. But for email security, security awareness, testing and filtering. SANS has their security awareness. If you don't have a security awareness program within your organization, oh, please fix that and actively test your users. Make sure you have banners that say, this is an external email. And when they click on those external emails that you have sent them and they do stupid stuff, you need to let them know, hey, no. <laughs> now, obviously don't, don't be rude about it, but you have to do that. And please filter. I can share out a list I have later of particular file types, for example, you should be filtering. If you have the ability, and, and you do, by the way, to enable SPF, I know it's a huge pain in the rear end, but it's very, very important that you at least take a look at that. In the 2010s, this is when threat intelligence started to become a, a big part of the security uh, ecosystem in general. Uh, the company I work for, Team Cymru, we, are, we operate in this space, the threat intelligence space. Threat intelligence applied properly is about informing decisions, business decisions through data. This is bringing the context that's available about actors, about threats, about what's going on and what, what the overall threat landscape looks like and applying that to your decisions of prioritizations or uh, you, how you're implementing defenses on your particular network. And our last slide here, due to time, we're not gonna go through the entire slide because I wanna try and not go over like I do at every talk I ever do. But everyone thinks these, these days, backups, backups, right? Just backups, no. Actors are gonna be within your environment um, and James, please mention this part. We'll hit this one before we head on the bandwidth. Yeah, we'll do. Uh, think through the technical limits of, of space and time, right? Everybody is bound by the laws of physics. If your backups are remote, how quickly can you restore machines? This is both a human bandwidth time as well as a, a physical network and, and system bandwidth time. Do you have slow disks? Do you have slow tapes? Do you have, uh, do you have inadequate band bandwidth? The restoral process is going to be driven by both what your system, how your systems can perform when you're doing your, your recovery, as well as how well that process is orchestrated. So think through the logistics. And of course, just a final point, the whole point of this slide is, is that backups are not the, the only solution. Someone also asked in chat, you know, hey, what about like the Microsoft 365 security, like anti-ransomware? Those things detect when files are being encrypted for the most part, they're like, hey, Things have been x a week ago. They've been in your environment, getting all your usernames and your layout for the past week. And now they're encrypting your stuff. And you're like, cool story. So do not only rely on backups, but even if you do recall that all these items on this slide, it's very important. Having backups, just having them means nothing. And that takes us and to the 30 seconds of <laughs> 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 I think we're gonna we're gonna, what we're gonna do with the uh, unanswered questions, and I really appreciate uh, both you and uh, James. Uh, we're uh, really doing a good job answering a lot in the uh, text. Um, Sands and I will be pulling off the questions, and the ones that are unanswered, we're gonna be sending over to you both of you, and then we'll try to post the overall um, the Q and A on it, the Sands blog a little bit later today once we get uh, y'all's responses. Um, and that way we'll post the webcast, uh, the link to it, and of course, any of the following questions. So if anyone has any final questions you want to put in there that, want, that you want them to uh, be able to address in the blog, now's your final chance. Um, obviously, this topic um, can clearly exceed an hour. 
Uh, it's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, we're all staring at Ryan right now and saying, hey, you know, Ryan, when, when can we start seeing uh, new course dev uh, for this? Because I think it's really important. You know, it's really timely right now. Um, and he's currently working on it. So it should be out later this year. Uh, but, um, you know, if there's any additional suggestions for additional follow on webcasts, uh, you know, please send them uh, to me uh, or Ryan or uh, James and, you know, we'll collude and uh, talk about it. You know, want to do a, a continued series on this because it is very important uh, to get information out, you know, so, so people can uh, make this um, very useful in the end. Uh, Ryan, James, uh, truly appreciate you taking time out of your schedules uh, to come with us again. Um, I know you two are very busy uh, individuals and your expertise and uh, capabilities here really uh, seem strong. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Without, any, uh, without anything else, uh, thanks everyone on behalf of the SANS Institute. Um, my name is Rob Lee. I appreciate you attending uh, today's webcast. Bye-bye. Cheers.